Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Smith. I lead work on nature at UNEP FI. I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel now on nature-based solutions. And nature-based solutions have been getting a lot of attention recently. Uh, it seems like a good news story for meeting climate, nature, and development goals. So today we're going to talk about uh, nature-based solutions for mitigation, adaptation, and resilience building across a whole bunch of different ecosystems. Um, from the mitigation side, the carbon in our atmosphere is really the balance of greenhouse gas emissions and the sequestration of carbon. And the net zero debate has really been focused on just one side of this ledger so far, the, the emission side. And that's certainly important, but it's not the full picture. And as we are losing nature, we're really undermining our efforts in every single other sector where we're trying to limit and reduce emissions. So an example of this that I hope gives a picture is with whales. So some years ago, the IMF released a study that gave a value of 2 million for every single whale in the ocean in terms of its carbon sequestration potential. Um, and as we've lost around four fifths of, of the world's whales so far, and many whale species are down to just 3% of their original populations, we've actually lost a whole bunch of the nature-based solution to our climate problem. And we might not even be facing this problem today if, if we had not had that lost so many whales in the past. So this is just an example to illustrate, you know, there are many nature-based solutions around us, some of which have been well studied, some of which less so, but studies are coming out every day that's really showing and valuing the power of nature to help us mitigate climate change. And we're also seeing opportunities, for example, from wetlands for storm and flood protection. And really nature-based opportunities are seen as another way to bring indigenous peoples and local communities into climate finance, nature finance, to really help them who are on the front line of climate and nature risks. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Inter, um, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services have shown that there are more synergies than trade-offs in addressing climate change and nature loss in land and seascapes. And in fact, just yesterday, these two panels just won the Gulben Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity for their efforts. So I'm absolutely pleased today to be joined by Evo Mulder, who's the head of our Climate Finance Unit at UNEP, Candace Stevens, who's the chair of the Sustainable La Landscapes Finance Coalition, Frank Hawkins, who is a policy advisor to IUCN and chair of the executive committee for the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation. Niru Pillai, who's the general manager of research and intelligence for Land Bank South Africa. And Kato Masahiro, who's head of responsible investment for MUFG. Now, if I can first hand over to Evo to do a bit of scene setting. So UNEP has been doing a state of finance for nature report that's been quantifying the nature finance gap. And uh, Evo, you're going to give us an update because we have a new version coming soon. Thank you, Jessica. And um, thanks for the, for the invite uh, to participate. Um, if I could ask colleagues to, to put on the, the, the slides. What I will indeed be doing is to give you a sneak preview of, of work that will be published in about two weeks uh, uh, for the second edition of the State of Finance for Nature. But to give a bit of a bird's eye view, uh, and this may have been mentioned uh, also in other sessions, um, it seems that we, we find ourselves in the eye of the storm uh, with uh, rising food and, and energy costs, um, a growing number of families, including in also developed uh, countries have to choose between uh, paying for your energy of putting food on the table. Um, and rising food and energy, of course, is leading uh, to higher inflation, which is uh, leading central banks to tighten monetary policy. And on top of that, you also see that we have increasingly um, extreme weather events. Think about the fact that almost a third of, uh, of Pakistan was, was underwater. Um, and also a growing number of ecosystems showing signs of distress or, or even breakdown. Um, and while I think there's quite a bit of information available of how much money is being invested in renewable energy and energy efficiency or sustainable transport, 
there's less information available of how much we're actually investing in nature. Both nature and cities think about green roofs, green parks to reduce the heat island effects, investments in mangroves to protect against uh, storm surges, um, sustainable agriculture, or, or investing in national parks. All of these are, are so-called nature-based solutions that can help improve the quality of life, stimulate the economy, and obviously uh, deal with the climate crisis. So if I could move to the next slide, please. So what is at stake? Um, basically, rivers from across Europe, uh, the, the Rhine to, to the, the Yangtze in, in, in China, um, were falling dry. Uh, a lot, lots of uh, companies had uh, difficulties um, moving their goods across. The costs were basically elevated and um, the, the revenues were, were lower because the, not the same amount of, um, of goods could be shipped. Um, California is, is almost experiencing yearly uh, massive for, forest fires. And, and you see also that the Amazon is uh, showing signs of distress with some scientists uh, warning that there is a potential tipping point that the, that the tropical forest of the Amazon could um, turn into savanna if too much forest being lost and this, this nurturing effect of uh, the clouds um, increasingly disappearing. Could I see the next slide, please? Because I don't see the slide deck moving. Just checking with the IT system if that's happening. Yeah, thanks. And then last but not least, you also see uh, coral reef systems um, showing signs of major distress. And again, scientists are, are saying that in the next 20 years, we'll see a, a decline or even a collapse of 70 to 90 percent uh, of coral reefs. So it is a bit of a doom and gloom scenario, but at the same time, it is it is a reality. It's a reality of the unsustainable lives that we're leading. The fact that politicians are not treating this as a crisis, we do see that COVID has been treated as a crisis. Um, massive amount of fiscal stimulus has been made available. Uh, the climate is also the nature crisis has stayed below the radar. Everyone knows it, it's looming behind the background. Um, but so far, um, there has been an insufficient degree of urgency exacerbated by um, or, or instilled by by the, the by politicians, by business, and also by finance institutions. And this, will have to change very, very quickly. If I could go to the next slide, and that's also going to be my last one. So what I'm showing on this one is, is basically um, the amount of money that's invested in nature-based solutions, uh, as well as in climate finance overall, how much it needs to increase in the, in the years to come, and what are the economic costs if we fail to do so. So if you look at the, the left-hand side of this slide, um, the forthcoming reports on the state of finance for nature that, that also Jessica alluded to will showcase that we're investing about 154 billion US dollars at the moment into nature-based solutions. Of that, most of it is, uh, is in terrestrial areas. Only 9% is, is directed towards marine areas, even though they cover about almost three quarters of the Earth's surface. If you look at climate finance, so that's the blue bars, it's about 632 billion US dollars. So you can think about solar PV, onshore, offshore wind, uh, et cetera. On the flip side, you see those bars pointing downwards are nature negative and climate negative finance flows. For nature negative, we only looked at uh, public finance for um, those types of agriculture policies and fishery subsidies that are both price distorting and have a massive ne uh, negative impact on nature. So not all the subsidies, but you'll see those are orders of magnitude larger, uh, both for climate finance in general and then for nature finance. Turning to the middle part of this, it shows for both how much it will have to increase. Um, so basically, our research uh, that we're putting out in two weeks will showcase that we'll have to, um, to double investments in nature-based solutions in the next three years, by 2025, and almost triple it by 2030, if we are to achieve the global commitments related to keeping uh, climate change in check to well below two degrees, turn around the tide on biodiversity loss, and move uh, towards massive land restoration as well. Climate finance will have to increase in the order of six times, while at the same time, the nature negative and climate negative finance will have to be phased out as soon as possible. 
what happens if we don't? Um, research by Swiss Re found out that by the middle of the century, even if we achieve the Paris Agreement, we can expect a 4% loss on GDP compared to the baseline, um, even if we do everything well. Um, so that has basically been the bill that we have to, to pay for the fact that we have done way too little to date. The bill will further increase if we do nothing. So they've basically calculated with growing temperature rises what the negative impact on the economy will be year on year with uh, a 2.6 degree, uh, which is what we're currently looking at. Even if all the, the, the climate actions are being taken care of, it will still lead to a 2.6, 2.7 degree warmer world. That will lead to a 14% decline of GDP. Um, and of course, also about half the, 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 the global economy is either moderately or highly dependent on nature. I've put it in a, in a dotted line because it is at the moment difficult to say how much of, of the economy will be uh, at stake depending on the degree of nature loss. Um, but I think it is fair to say that uh, this is not something that's in the distant future that uh, will only affect your children or grandchildren. This is something that will affect us in the years to come. Uh, and again, maybe the, the final quote that uh, that I'll leave you with um, before handing back to Jessica is, again, this need to double investments in nature-based solutions in the next three years if we are to turn around the, the tide on biodiversity loss, nature climate solutions, and restoration. So time is really up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Evo. And, you know, I try to stay positive. I'm looking for the opportunities and the solutions. But indeed, the situation is very serious and we don't have much time. Now, if I can come to Nehru, you know, Land Bank is operating in South Africa and there's a lot of different pressures that you face. But nature based solutions, you know, is an opportunity. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you approach this topic and particularly around the, the food uh, situation, which is, again, very serious? Uh, thanks, Jessica. So just uh, a little bit of a brief context. Uh, as you said, uh, South Africa, there are a number of multiple uh, pressing needs. Um, we are a country that uh, still has a lot of racial uh, inequalities, which us as a development finance institution in the agricultural sector must concurrently address whilst we deal with the issues around food security, around poverty and unemployment. So there, you know, there's a, a lot of different things that we're trying to address at the same time. And um, yeah, it, it's and it's a very urgent need because in South Africa, you you have a significant food insecurity problem within rural areas where most obviously where most of the agricultural production occurs um so how we how we're trying to deal with this is at different levels so uh, the most obvious in terms of the nature-based solutions is is to have uh, very serious uh, conversations with your clients the farmers themselves in terms of what are they doing to shift their agricultural practices uh, either towards more conservation agriculture or regenerative agriculture. So that is uh, that takes a bit of time. It, it's a bit of a, uh, a lengthy conversation because farmers have been doing certain things in a certain way for, for a long period of time and not always responsive to, to new, new ideas. And I think also the many of them are concerned about their bottom line. Uh, not that we're not concerned about their bottom line because it, it does also help us um, in terms of our financial sustainability but what we're also trying to do is is starting um, looking at it from internally so looking at it in terms of how do we address uh, nature-based solutions from a credit assessment uh, perspective so what, what are we what are we doing differently to look at an application for credit uh, assuming somebody comes through um, for maize uh, in a certain part of the province. So in South Africa, um, it is uh, half of the, certain half of the country, the Western half of the, of the country is getting distinctly drier than, than the Eastern half. So if somebody comes with an application for um, maize in, in, in the Western part, I mean, you know, that, that immediately um, alerts us to the fact that there are new risks that are, are going to come our way but at, at the same time there are also new opportunities of how we start engaging with clients to become more resistant or resilient uh, to the changes that they're going to encounter 
so that's that's one one area um, that we're looking at. Uh, I mean, we're doing a lot of uh, internal research in in trying to understand what is it that we need to change in terms of our systems to allow and to facilitate and to incentivize uh, nature-based solutions. The the odd thing about uh, the land bank itself is that it um, it is a development finance institution owned by the state, but it also sources all of its uh, funding from the capital market. So the capital market is is a little bit different in terms of the uh, the private sector doesn't seem to be matching the pace for uh, nature based finance for agriculture. They've done a lot, and it's been uh, in terms of climate finance for um, renewable energy. So it, it looks a lot on, on, on the mitigation side of, of climate, but we're not seeing the same volumes or interest uh, when it comes to agriculture. So we, 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 we're trying to deal with the problem sort of uh, on different levels and to try and, 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 and address many different uh, multiple goals at the same time. Um, I'm not sure I've answered all your questions, Jessica. I, I think it just gives us a good picture and introduces, um, you know, the context that you're working in. And Candace, you're also based in South Africa. Now, you know, in the question of how do we scale finance for nature-based solutions, we always hear, where's the pipeline? Where's the pipeline? Well, you are building the pipeline. Can you tell us about uh, your work? Thanks, Jessica. So uh, the Sustainable Finance Coalition is, is based out of South Africa, but we, we cover 12 different African countries at the moment. And the question around introducing sustainable finance into to land and seascapes uh, to be able to boost nature-based solutions is, is a critical one. Um, and one of the, the big challenges we face is the gap between projects on the ground in these different land and seascapes um, and access to finance. So the financial sector are on every different level is saying we are looking for projects and projects are saying we're looking to, for finance. Um, and yet that, that gap still remains and we're not seeing the increase of finance regardless of the type of instrument uh, or the different sources, being able to plug into those nature-based solutions and seeing them go to scale. And this speaks whether it's uh, looking at you know, national parks, uh, whether it's looking at ecopreneurs and new innovations and ideas um, and across you know, urban uh, to rural environments. And so part of that pipeline building process is the ability to be able to translate language. Um, and so often we find in the environmental and social sectors, uh, the value language that's used is very different to language that's used in you know, commercial financial sectors. And so bridging that gap means starting to create a cohesive network where different sectors can begin to merge together um, have conversations, network, understand the different language that we're using so that we can start to create these meet and match moments. The other question is particularly around risk and return. Um, and this is really where the private sector has a role to play in being able to pivot and understand what's needed to be able to create these large scale transformative investments on the ground. Um, and this really requires us to say, how do we begin adjusting our vision of risk how do we begin adjusting our vision of return? Um, and then the last thing, um, beyond language, beyond networking, and beyond that, that pivot for risk and return, we really want to be able to address point of impact. Is the finance that we're putting into nature-based solutions, is the support uh, and the investment coming into that development of the pipeline, is it really hitting what it needs to hit? Is it supporting the people that really need that access to finance the most? Uh, and is it able to, to address that nexus between climate and biodiversity at a landscape or seascape level? Thank you, Candace. And I'm going to come next to Frank. Now, the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation has, has been around some years. I'd love to hear from you, you know, what do you think are the next steps in scaling finance for nature-based solutions. But I think like me, you're concerned not only in the, the absolute quantity of these financial flows, but to, that they that they reach, and I think as Candace said as well, you know, that they reach the right point of impact and the people who you know, are front line on the projects. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. And it's a great delight to be with you here. I'm in uh, 
Jeju at the uh, IUCN Leaders Forum, where we've been talking about nature positive investment. Uh, and we've made a great deal of interesting progress on that front. Um, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation there, Candice. It's a, a, a kind of a compliment to what it is that you said that I'd like to provide here. Um, the Coalition for Private Investment for Conservation, um, the underlying goal is to increase deal flow to, to projects that deliver conservation impact, but also generate positive social impact as well. And there's loads of money that wants to do that. The problem is the supply. There aren't really, there are very, very few investable deals out there um, that are that for which private finance can, can uh, put money into. Um, and there's an enormous amount of biodiversity, things that you want to target that money at, and also uh, communities that are managing that biodiversity that don't get that flow. What's the problem here? Well, what are we trying to solve? What's the issue that we're trying to resolve here? The biggest problem is the transaction costs of creating those deals. And those transaction costs are not going to be borne by the finance sector. You won't get finance people to pay for the long process it requires to get a deal to the point of investability. Those transaction costs include things like setting up governance structures, ensuring that you've got some sort of equitable uh, uh, participation in economies. You need to deliver uh, an approach which is uh, uh, focusing on rights. And you also need to, in many cases, improve the, the, the capacity of the project developers in order that they are building a deal which is actually investable and technically sound and also delivering the conservation outcomes. Many of these deals, as Candy said, are very small. Um, they are perceived as being very high risk by the investor sector. So you have to frame all those transaction cost issues in such a way that you're creating uh, enough volume for the, the finance sector to, to uh, engage in this market. And that's a really tough ask. That's basically why we don't have the, the flow, uh, the deal flow going to places where it's really needed. Um, in order that you uh, can make this, cover the cost of these transaction uh, costs, um, the, the outcomes are, are incredibly important. You're, you're aiming to increase, uh, to deliver real and significant improvements in economies that maintain the vital biodiversity assets that are supporting the incomes of, of millions and millions of local people and indigenous people around the world, the people who are basically the guardians of uh, biodiversity in many parts of the world. And you need to apply a set of principles which already exist, like such as the nature-based solutions uh, set of criteria, but also the rights-based approach and proper governance structures. To cover those costs, you need orders of magnitude, hundreds of times more support to the process of developing those projects. And they need to cover the blockages that I indicated earlier, the transaction costs. Traditionally, those resources have come from uh, philanthropy and donor support. Um, these are very important, but they're very limited. It's very hard to scale those up. There's lots of initiatives going on at the moment to create innovative financial mechanisms that can provide some of those uh, resources uh, that are bundled in, in uh, through um, uh, mechanisms. Potentially, biodiversity credits is one way to go. Very difficult to implement, uh, but you know there's movement going in that direction. One of the really key steps that we need to make sure happens is that that need and that uh, channel, that place where finance can flow, is recognised in the global biodiversity framework, which is going to be agreed in a very short order in in Montreal uh, in a couple of months' time. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well, Kato, I'll come to you next. MUFG is an absolutely huge financial institution, so it's very exciting to have you on board for this session. Now, in the work that you're doing, uh, you are addressing the drivers of biodiversity loss, particularly pollution and climate. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about that and how for MUFG, could this help you to meet your net zero commitments as well? Oh, thank you very much, Jessica. And uh, thank you very much for this great opportunity. And I'm head of responsible investment for asset management business side of MUFG. So my comment is from the investor point of view today. And uh, for your reference, we are a member of NZAM, NZAM, TCFD, and TNFD as well. Today, I would like to 
focus on our microfiber collaborative engagement program, which is a very specific nature-based solution by engaging with target companies to request to put filter on washing machine to prevent at source to the majority of microfibers. One of our reasons why we think this is very important is that uh, there are uh, not many specific solutions to tackle with biodiversity, which is very huge, wide, and important issues at the moment. Microscopic fibers that are released from textiles in clothes and household goods called microfibers are rapidly becoming a growing problem in oceans. Obviously, healthy oceans are vital in fight with against the climate change. Oceans absorb 25% of global carbon emissions and it's the world largest store of carbon. For example, sea grasses is much more efficient at absorbing CO2 than forest and then rainforest and it can store it 35 times faster. Ocean pro produces between 50 to 50 and 80 percent oxygen we breath. Approximately 2 million tons of microfibers enter the ocean every year. The total amount of microfibers in the ocean is currently sought to exceed 1.5 trillion tons. Once in the environment, microfibers can be easily ingested by organisms and move up the food chain, eventually uh, containing mining, mining human foods. In marine environments, organisms such as shellfish, zooplankton, and the fish often mistake microfibers for food, meaning microfibers have, have been found in the deep ocean, on beaches, in rivers, and in the atmospheres as a result. They have also been found in animals, plants, human prey, plants, plants, and in our food. Every year, it is estimated we eat up to 25 to 250 grams of microplastics. This is very important issues from Japanese point of view because we love fish and we eat fish a lot. From the MEFG point of view, as one of the biggest asset management company in Japan, we are keen on collaborative engagement and uh, think we'd like to lead the initiatives to contribute to solve the situation. For example, Microfiber Collaborative Engagement Program was established and uh, have been led by FSI, First Century Investors, who is our 100% subsidiaries with us. Mm -hmm. We have a group of 30 institutional investors representing 5.6 trillion US dollars in AUM, uh, collaborating to support this initiative. The program involves involves the investors engaging directly with target companies and with their respective trade associations. It has two clear and specific objectives. One, encourage the target companies to commit to having factory fit plastic microfibers filter mm -hmm. fitted as standard in all new machines by the end of 2023. Second, encourage policymakers to implement legislation uh, prohibiting the sale of new commercial and domestic washing machines without filter machines, filter mechanism built in. In addition, this is my final comment as introduction. We think this is be, uh, it is be also very important to provide neutral and practical research report to penetrate the importance of sustainability and action. So we established Investment Research Institute. We call this as 
MUFG、ファーストセンティア・サステナブル・インベスメント・インスティテュート、in May 2021, and providing research papers on the website, including microfiber report, because this is very important issues and having easy,、uh, very basic solutions for it. That's it from me at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Keto. And I saw some very positive reactions from the audience.、Uh, it's a very concrete solution、uh, with a high positive impact for our aquatic environment.、Um, it, you know, it, I think it's something that's in the realm of nature based solutions that wouldn't precisely match IUCN's. Criteria, but it's definitely one that has you know, a positive point of impact you know, in,、uh, and addresses the drivers of biodiversity loss,、uh, which are very, very serious. Now, Evo, coming to you, you know, your team has done such a lot in this space. And you know, we heard particularly from Candace and Frank about you know, the need to build these investable deals. Um, you guys are you know, within the Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility. You have the Restoration Seed Capital Facility. You're doing quite a lot of innovation around blended finance. What is missing in the landscape? You know, we, we often hear, let's point at DFIs, but、um, you know, what's more on the, on the private sector side as well? Yeah, thanks, Jessica.、Um, I think Frank、uh, made a, a very important remark, which is around transaction costs. So,、um, at the moment, for a bank like MUFG, Rabobank, for an investor, it's simply less profitable、uh, to put together a deal in which、um, a certain degree of, of risk is mitigated、uh, by, say, a, a public finance component through a first loss or a guarantee or otherwise. Simply because more hours need to be spent to constructing the deal because they're often more complex. And if something is less profitable, it's, 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 there needs to be a very high willingness、uh, from the firm to actually do it、um, uh, because it will compete with anything else that is happening.、Uh, and there are, of course, also commercial targets that a lot of、uh, teams from corporate banking to、uh, investment banking、uh, have, to, have to adhere to. I think, besides transaction costs, the amount of public money that is made available to de risk investments is also way too low.、Um, I think there's a general、um, term that is being used and a general number that's being used that nature based solutions can be cost effective to deal with the climate crisis、um, in terms of cost, cost effective mitigation measures. But only 3% of public climate funding at the moment is directed towards that. So, the other interesting thing is that research by Convergence showed that the amount of public concessional finance has actually decreased over the past years. So, we need a, mess- we need a massive increase in the relative、um, amount of money that public、uh, institutions are making available, but also a massive upscaling of the absolute amounts.、Um, So that is one,、uh, because without some form of risk mitigation, it will be very difficult to, to ask an investor or bank to take all the risk. Second is transaction cost. And then the third is there's not going to be a one size fits all.、Um, so we need solutions really upstream, supporting SMEs、um, with、uh, improvement of business plans, access to markets. Um, further downstream, you need to also work with a lot of DFIs. A lot of DFIs also require a、um, form of, of risk mitigation,、uh, like、uh, commercial entities. And then towards commercial banks、uh, and also、uh, institutional investors, you have to think about liquidity.、Uh, you have to think about、uh, the creation of a secondary market、uh, for, say, sustainable agriculture,、uh, restoration, et cetera. And that is hardly available at the moment. There's a few. Bonds that have been issued.、Um, there's very few listed companies at the moment that, that, are not,、um, that are not sort of having a massive negative impact on, on nature. So the, the,、um, the, uh, the different financial products will, will also have to be created. As you said, Jessica, our team has done a few of those.、Um, we, we call it demonstrating proof of concept to showcase that it is possible to do this. But we obviously hope that DFIs will basically push us out of the market, so to say, and, and, and simply say you've done your job and, and others can basically take from here. 
Thank you, Evo. And I'm thinking of this question of scaling, and I would love to hear from you, Candice. You know, recently Andrew Deutz said we can't shift trillions, 10 million at a time. You know, we need to really bundle. And I think the Landscapes Finance Coalition, you know, has the intent to bundle a whole bunch of different transactions at a landscape scale. Is this the way to get us to these, you know, huge uh, ticket prices that, um, you know, are really going to bring mainstream finance? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. So I think ticket size remains one of the, the critical hurdles that we need to jump. Uh, so when we're looking at SMEs or uh, ecopreneurs, different projects on the ground, uh, they're nowhere near the, the ticket size um, that uh, a lot of institutions, regardless of, of where they are in the market, would even begin to look at. Um, and so the, the big question is, how do we begin to, to pivot this and begin to address it? And I think there are a number of different ways to do it. One of the things we've done in the coalition is to launch the Lion's Den where we can put projects uh, and build that, uh, support that transaction cost, build that capacity uh, to be as close to investor ready as possible, um, but also to work with uh, different sectors, you know, uh, across uh, the financial plane to say uh, that a lot of these projects are not going to be typically investor ready in the way that we would understand it in the commercial sense. Um, and so getting that understanding in place so that they can meet these projects halfway and then working really hard in the background on issues such as governance um, and a lot of the points that, that Frank and, and Evo have mentioned. Um, so that in this meet and match moment in a Lion's Den context, you can start to see a little bit more of that aggregation. Um, and then the other question is also looking at um, how to, to bundle uh, a lot of these different ecopreneurs and projects together under specific banners. Um, under specific governance structures. And I think one of the gaps that remains across the board for, for those of us in the space to begin answering uh, is investment platforms that do have a collection of different projects underneath them that can then begin attracting the right type of ticket size and seeing that flow down to point of impact. Um, and one expression that uh, I love to use in, in explaining this is to think about hippos in the Okavango Delta in Botswana, when that water floods into the Delta, you need hippos to move through that water in order to begin spreading it um, and to make the Delta and the life that it brings go as far as possible. And so it is going to take uh, hippos, institutions and individuals that are going to push the boundary, that are going to innovate and really let finance spread further than it spread before. Fantastic. And Nero, I'm not sure if you're having a connection issue, if you are able to join us. I think I'm back. Okay, I have wonderful. a problem now with the internet. Yeah. Great, great. Well, you know, you Land Bank has a huge footprint across South Africa in terms of agricultural landscapes. Now, what more can we do to, you know, identify nature based solutions and finance them at scale in the food system? Now, many, many countries are identifying food price challenges right now, high volatility, uh, energy prices that are skyrocketing that affect, um, you know, our food system you know, hunger where, you know, uh, waste is happening in other places. Now, the food system is is so important, uh, both at the climate and nature interface and, and, you know, Land Bank with so many clients in that food space. What more do you think um, could be done to help bring nature-based solutions across that food system footprint? Uh, thanks, Jessica. Uh, just uh, maybe the maybe the use of the word "what more." Uh, I, I I I would be uh, more inclined to say "what must start to be done," because okay. I, I don't think nearly enough is done at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. and and I can say that from my own institution as well. So yeah, you you're quite right in that. Uh, you know, the food system is is very much a central part of of all these different aspects. The, the one thing that's come up uh, earlier on, and, and I know different people have spoken about it, uh, but more on, on a sort of larger context, is, is issues around barriers, you know, barriers to, to upscaling. And, and we see this not only uh, at, a, at a level in terms of upscaling, but also at, at the individual level. So there are barriers when it comes to individual farmers, individual financiers, uh, in terms of understanding the risk and return. 
So uh, I, I did uh, mention a little bit earlier that uh, traditionally farmers are, you know, they 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 quite happy with the way they've been doing things. So they they need they, it's actually become a bit of a barrier for them to change uh, uh, to new um, new uh, agricultural methods, largely because they're not always aware of the multiple benefits that will come through um, from from changing their practices. But I think from our side as a financier, one of the, the main things is, uh, and I think Ivo and others have indicated, this issue around risk sharing uh, and who assumes most of the risk. Uh, I think that that is quite an important part because neither the, the financier nor the, nor the client itself um, sort of is willing to absorb all the risk, you know. Uh, and so I think there's, there's room for a lot of uh, risk sharing through blended finance. Uh, certainly in our space, that's that's what we're looking for at the moment um, as we try and look at what are the opportunities when it comes to nature-based uh, solutions. So I, I think there's still lots to be done and it needs to be done quite urgently. I mean, you don't see nearly the scale that it should be, uh, certainly in, in, in South Africa. Um, but there's a, a lot of wonderful opportunities uh, to finance nat nature-based solutions. Um, with us, obviously, because you have a, a, a diversified portfolio in terms of commodities, they take on different aspects and, and, and you need different uh, customized solutions for all of them. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nero. Now, Kato, uh, MUFG, as a, you know, as I mentioned, uh, is enormous and the, the asset management um, side is, is very powerful. Now, as an asset manager, what would it take you know, for a higher risk appetite in this space, what what would what would you need to know or be convinced of to you know for the institution to to want to take more risks in this space? Well, thank you very much for your question. We think that uh, it is very important to understand the basics of the each important issues, obviously including climate change and uh, uh, biodiversity, etc. To uh, think and uh, to uh, reach to the uh, assumption what is the uh, most important elements or factors which we try to engage with the uh, investing companies others. So we need to learn more about uh, uh, sustainable ESG issues to have more efficient engagement and reach to the uh, more uh, outcomes by engaging with other investors, obviously, because uh, collaborative engagement also very important. Regarding the uh, topics which I mentioned about uh, microfiber today, in this case, it is important to find uh, interventions to prevent at source the majority of microfibers entering the oceans where they are virtually impossible to remove once they are there. And the government and the companies have a role to play. We as an investor want to support and they want to contribute to engage and uh, solve these problems with them. For example, French Secretary of State of Ecological Transitions announced uh, new ma washing machines will require a filter for capturing plastic microfibers from 2025 onwards. A bill to require manufacturers to fit microplastic catching filters to, to new domestic and commercial washing machines in UK, currently under review by the Department of Environment and Rural Affairs. One of the washing machine manufacturers called as Grandic already started to put the filter on washing machine to reduce the microfibers shedding from the machine. If Grandic can do it, and then so can the other washing machine makers, manufacturers. So uh, we think the importance of microfibers issues will increase and will be recognized more since past and then now, and it is, more, it is important to make actions for it. Uh, final comment 
from me is welcome investors to this solution if interested in. Maybe it's not a direct answer to your question, but uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Now, you mentioned the awareness of financial institutions. Actually, over the next year, Unipify and partners are going to be doing deep dives into different ecosystems uh, to help FIs understand what are the nature-based solutions available, for example, in the coastal and marine, uh, forested landscape, farmlands, urban areas, and grasslands. Uh, and then we'll be sort of introducing um, guidelines that already exist, criteria like IUCN's criteria, and uh, safeguards that are relevant to different ecosystems. So I think hopefully in the year ahead, the awareness of these uh, nature-based solutions opportunities increases amongst the members of, um, of UNIPFI and our, our partner platforms. Now, I think Frank has dropped off. He may have had a connection issue, but Frank um, uh, was in New York a couple of weeks ago at the New York uh, Climate Week, and IUCN and CPIC held a panel there, which uh, delved into a, a similar topic of how do we increase finance for nature-based solutions and conservation. And um, one of the outcomes of that panel was that we do need a Paris Agreement for Nature. And, you know, at the end of this year, we're heading towards the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, where we do expect in the draft, uh, target 19.1 is basically, um, you know, calling for an increase of finance to biodiversity. And goal D is like our Paris 2.1C, which is calling for the alignment of all financial flows. Now, maybe I can come to you, Evo. Can you connect a little bit this appetite at the normative level to, you know, what do we see from financial institutions? Are we expecting this Paris moment uh, to really increase the um, the interest from financial institutions in, you know, climate um, finance, nature finance, nature-based solutions finance, restoration finance, um, you know, all of these uh, areas that, uh, you know, we see the, the benefits flowing from. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I would certainly hope so, uh, Jessica. And I would also hope that the, the audience uh, agrees uh, with that as well. If you disagree, I would be interested to, to hear about your questions as well in the chat box. Um, but the financial industry also need, needs metrics. So in terms of the alignment, um, Jessica may have mentioned or, or others in other sessions this forthcoming task force on nature related financial disclosure that will finalize its framework by I think September next year that will provide a blueprint for how the financial sector can and needs disclose on risks uh, emanating from the, the impact and dependency on nature at the same time this is a plea uh, and a request from me uh, to those finance institutions who are present is of course net zero is important and net zero means about uh, investing in solar PV it means about onshore offshore uh, renewable energy and of course um, to make buildings also retrofitted but at the same time it also means investing in nature and I, I would see it I would say as a an R&D phase where you are investing in building that kind of expertise within your institution whether it's in capital markets whether it's in corporate lending whatever you're strong at um, but then afterwards, you will be better placed than your peers, uh, whether it comes around nature-based solutions for the marine environment, whether it comes to sustainable agriculture. Um, Kato mentioned about washing machines. I mean, it's not something that you would think of immediately, but obviously the amount of fibers that are entering the waterways and ultimately oceans is massive. So think about like what, what kind of solutions can you focus on? Um, as part of and beyond the net zero. So make it net zero, make it nature positive at the same time. Um, and as Jessica said, this is my final point on this on this question is, it is an alignment at portfolio level, both on climate related risks and nature related risks, but it's also about like looking for innovative solutions, be it in the form of blended finance or purely commercially viable already that you can roll out as part of your asset management business or, or corporate uh, banking. Thank you, Evo. And if I could come to Candice on the innovative solutions, you know, we're we're getting to a point where there's, you know, increasing awareness, we're starting to see guidelines, criteria, CPIC produced blueprints. Now, what are the 
innovative finance opportunities that you're watching in the year ahead? So I think, Jessica, when it comes to, to innovation, really, the, the sky is the limit. Um, there, there is a, a wealth of opportunity in this space, whether it's uh, pivoting your own organization and your own entity, um, not just to you know, stop falling behind the curve, but also enhance opportunities to grow in this space. Um, and then the, the other side of innovation is beyond just the sky is the limit. There is also the understanding that we need to have tailor-made solutions for specific problems in specific contexts. So the way in which I always look at innovative finance is that we're not chasing after some green finance unicorn. There's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow or no silver bullet. Um, but what we want to see is a toolbox that is full with a, a range of different and innovative tools that as we approach different solutions, we can reach into that toolbox and begin to pull out different financial instruments and different mechanisms that we can then begin to start to address the problem. And I think, you know, when we look at the public sector, there is a critical role uh, in looking at incentives and subsidies, uh, the positive ones that are going to be able to support uh, so many of these interventions. We can't fill a bucket with a hole in it. Um, if we can't align our incentives and subsidies, we're going to continue to have a drain on finance. Um, and so there is a resource efficiency question that needs to be addressed at the same time as looking at innovative solutions. As we throw in those innovative solutions and as they begin to pile up, we want to make sure that there isn't a, a hole at the bottom of the bucket that the finance drains away. And then I think for the private sector, it's as we move beyond reporting, uh, it's to step into a place of action. How do we get involved uh, as individuals and as individual organizations and entities in the development of some of these tools and solutions? And it might be lending your skill set. It might be putting uh, finance or funding towards it. Um, and it might be actually, you know, being that hippo, being that innovator that actually finds a way uh, to move that finance further. Thank you, Candace. Well, no one on the panel specifically called out any new technologies, but I think we're also hearing more around the opportunities to do with uh, technologies. And I learned this morning about the Uplink uh, platform that's supported by the World Economic Forum, Deloitte and Salesforce, which uh, seems promising. And we are seeing opportunities, for example, with uh, blockchain and other technologies that are promoted by the Green Digital Finance Alliance. Um, so all in all, you know, we're starting to see um, with the TNFD disclosures that are going to clarify where there are failures in our market system. Uh, we're seeing, as I mentioned, you know, guidelines, criteria, you know, with the global biodiversity framework, we're going to have, you know, a clear uh, North Star for financial institutions to uh, move towards and, um, you know, set their targets around, uh, hopefully appetite to exchange. Many financial institutions have signed the Finance for Biodiversity Pledge or are considering to set um, biodiversity related targets. Um, within the um, principles for responsible banking and other commitments. Uh, we spoke yesterday about nature positive insurance. Uh, so I do see sort of a groundswell of, you know, action from the financial sector on nature and nature based solutions. And I am optimistic, although the challenges are, you know, the challenges are very severe. I do see uh, new green shoots, uh, which we like to call them. Um, so we are again starting the year on a positive note. Uh, if, if some of you may have participated last year, we uh, ran a panel where Evo spoke um, and others. We cataloged what were all the new nature finance opportunities that came to market over the past year and showcased them and then you know, had a subsequent session that we talked to financial institutions about how they could get started with nature finance. So we're planning to run the same, as I said, next January. So January 2023, look out for that. And we will also be uh, doing this 11 month learning journey on nature based solutions that will have the ecosystem deep dives. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the podcast uh, that I'm so happy to collaborate with uh, uh, Evo's team and the Green Finance Institute 
on financing nature. That's a five part series that's being released in the lead up to COP27, promoting nature as a way to meet climate challenges and related development challenges. So I hope you'll look out for that. Uh, episode two has just been released. Episode three focuses on Africa, which is really at the leading edge of nature finance solutions, which I'm very excited about. And I just want to thank all of our panelists. I think we've covered a few different ecosystems and some different approaches to this topic. And I'm leaving, um, you know, our global roundtable. It's been a busy week for everybody, but I'm leaving on an optimistic note uh, that the pieces are coming together to uh, finance nature and nature can help meet FI's net zero commitments. So thank you very much for your time and your efforts. Thank you.